the North Sea. From its windswept shores to quaint cities with their windmills and quiet canals, the Netherlands depends on water as its lifeline. But hidden below the surface of Dutch waters lie hundreds of sunken ships threatening the nation's livelihood. As the world's sea trade grows in size, Europe's maritime gateway must remain free of juggernauts. In the summer of 2013, the Dutch government began an extraordinary campaign to clean out the nation's channels of old shipwrecks, silent dangers rusting under the surface for decades. The waterways of the Netherlands are the vital lifeline for the whole of Europe. Whether through the Rhine estuary or the ports of Rotterdam, goods and raw materials make their way through Dutch national waters to Germany, the continent's powerhouse. But wrecks litter the sea floor and create dangerous bottlenecks in supply lines, posing a serious hazard to the nation's economy. The wrecks either needed to be removed or reduced in height to ensure free passage of the giant cargo ships that Europe's economy depends on. Every year, the Dutch government's Ministry of Public Works, the Rijkswaterstaat, orders a clean out of the nation's port approaches. The four wrecks to be salvaged in this job were an unknown wreck lying on the bottom of the Ijol Channel, the Ariana cargo ship which blocked the Westerschelt waterway, the Jan Breidel fishing boat lying in the entry channel to Rotterdam's Europort, and an 1860s steamship lying off the island of Vleeland. In 2013, two companies were commissioned to do the job, salvage giant Smith Salvage and the family-run company of Van den Herren. Most of the economic power in Europe uh, is coming from our na uh, neighbors on the east. So Holland is situated very well for the connection of the big river Rhine, you can say, or Waal in Holland. We are naturally found a good position because the river is there and the, uh, the big steel companies were in the 1880s uh, in Germany. So we are connected together by nature. Well, they wanted to make um, the, the approaches to the, to the harbors uh, more uh, safe. And there were some obstacles in the way. And so this is uh, all about safety and, uh, and getting a, a more efficient uh, uh, sailing to and from the, the ports. Here in the headquarters of Van den Herrick in Schliedrecht, east of Rotterdam, salvage masters and engineers plan the operation down to each minute detail using the latest 3D modeling and mapping technology. We had the wrecks in the Westerschelde, uh, the entrance to Antwerp, and we had a wreck on the north uh, above the island of Freeland. Meanwhile, in their nearby shipyard, Welders prepare the buckets and grippers used on the barges in the open sea. Van den Herrick is a medium-sized company, but it stays at the forefront of salvage technology by engineering and constructing most of its own equipment. This way, they can tailor each barge, gripper or tool for the particular ship salvage or dredging job that lies ahead. With hundreds of shipwrecks littering the sea floor, there is no lack of work. The Van den Herrick fleet of barges and work units is constantly making Holland's waterways safer. Yeah, we have engineering department uh, inside and we have uh, the guys with the good brains outside, never forget that. On the, uh, when theory and practice on this point where it cuts, there is the true, 
of the best equipment. And we think we have to do it ourselves to be one step better as the, the other companies. There's always competition. And uh, like in football, only the best is in the team. The Westerschelde is the segment of the Rhine estuary that runs between the Netherlands and Belgium to Antwerp. 200 million tons of cargo pass through here every year. Until 2013, its navigation was hampered by the wreck of the Ariana, a cargo ship that sank in 1952. René Tromp is Van den Herrick's supervisor on the big wreck removal operations. Uh, the Ariana is a ship which sunk, which sunk in 1952 because the pilot made a shortcut and made a big mistake by you know, taking the shortcut too late with uh, falling water. So it got stuck and uh, after two, three hours of uh, pulling with, uh, of trying to get off the sandbank, uh, it broke. The salvage work was authorized by the Dutch Ministry for Infrastructure and Environment. At the end of August 2013, Minister Melanie Schulz van Hagen visited the salvage operation to get a hands-on feel for how the channel clearing was proceeding. Helemaal weghalen is vaak heel moeilijk omdat ze zeker na zoveel jaar echt al helemaal in het zand liggen. Dat geldt ook voor dit schip. Dus ze zitten gewoon voor een deel ondergronds. Nou, dan maakt het ook niet zoveel uit. Maar het deel wat er boven zit en wat geraakt kan worden, dat, dat halen we eigenlijk weg. Het blijft dus een soort blind date onder water, waarin je op basis van de scans die je hebt van de bodem en van het schip probeert om het op een gecontroleerde manier boven te brengen. En op dit moment lukt dat aardig. Ja, het is natuurlijk uh, leuk om te doen. Je moet eerst een paar keer uh, grijpen voordat je echt een stuk schip uh, te pakken hebt. Maar dan trilt uh, zo'n apparaat heel erg en uh, ja, vervolgens kun je dat ijzer weer mee omhoog krijgen en op het schip leggen. En dan is er een stukje werk gedaan. Zo, so, ja, yeah, old ship, loaded with uh, iron uh, material. Is that one big clump of iron, and that's why we, we, we invented peat. Uh, I had the idea together with our chief uh, technical department uh, to rip, to rip all the, the, the yeah, especially the uh, the iron parts apart, and then pick them up with the uh, with the excavator. When the Ariana sunk here in the Westerschelde in 1952, it was carrying iron bars. Salvage masters had to cut off any part of the ship that protruded above 15 meters depth. But the ship's cargo hampered the work. Accurate survey of the wreck site is vital for success. The hardest part was to, uh, from that ship we knew uh, which ship it was, what, what was the front and what was the back was not very clear. So we really have to, uh, we discussed uh, after each session, we only could work there with low water, uh, with the two uh, excavator uh, engineers uh, with me from uh, what is it, and oh, that's the back and that's a part of the ship. But the, the part between the cargo hull and the engine room, there was one very tough part we hardly could get. If removing the Ariana wreck proved a technological challenge, Rene's next task would prove hazardous too, due to the location of the wreck. The sea off the island of Vleeland is one of the most dangerous in the Netherlands. Meanwhile, the Smith teams had just come off their part of the cleanup campaign with a spectacular raising of the Jan Bridal fishing boat. Smit Salvage was commissioned by the Rijkswaterstaat to remove two wrecks from the North Sea. Kies van Essen is Smit Salvage's head of operations and is responsible for selecting new salvage masters. We select our salvage masters from the merchant marine, so people who have been at sea like myself for 10, 15 years, being a chief officer or even a captain, and then uh, when we have a vacancy, we have some people who are interested in the job 
we test them thoroughly and then they are sent out on a job. The biggest challenges for salvage masters is not always salvaging the ship, but rather coordinating the many interested parties who must work together on projects like these, which are national in scale. With its great maritime tradition, it is no surprise that the Netherlands boasts the largest salvage companies in the world. They draw their young resources from the merchant marines, which in turn is supplied with well-trained personnel by specialized facilities such as this one in Rotterdam, the STC school where students learn the basics of nautical engineering. I think you have to, uh, you need a person, and it can be, we have also one female service master, so it's not especially a man, but you need a person who can deal with authorities, can deal with manage a team, uh, but also uh, knows what he's talking about, so he knows what the ship is, and he has to very well cooperate with your, with the superintendent of the team and the team itself, because that are the guys who have a long uh, training and experience in the salvage operations. I think that is almost always there is danger in, uh, in our job, because we, uh, we work in, uh, in uh, difficult, strange and, uh, and dangerous environments. So the vessel could be on fire or the vessel uh, could be aground, uh, leaking, uh, uh, possible to break or to sink. Or... So there is always the possibility that uh, complications um, would turn up and that, uh, that the whole situation would become from dangerous to really, really dangerous. And even uh, that you have to evacuate your own personnel from the, from the vessel. Smith Salvage has been contracted to remove two deep wrecks the unknown wreck lying upside down in the Ijol Canal, and the Jan Bridal in the approaches to Rotterdam. Their campaign started in early summer 2013, and they would employ their largest barges and shear legs to do the job. Captain Bart Huitzing is the salvage master who ran the Jan Bridal operation. The Jan Bridal was standing uh, straight up on the, on the seabed, uh, fully intact, as we could see from the survey data. So we decided to, uh, to use one of our tuck lifts, the, this time the tuck lift 7, to lift a complete wreck in, uh, in one time from the seabed. We decided to, to lift her in, uh, in one piece because it would be more efficient, more quick, and also less danger for, uh, for our divers. July 2013, Captain Bart Huitzing inspects the material to be transferred to the shear leg and soon the team is ready to leave. We used uh, one of our Smith barges and two tugboats to accompany uh, us and to assist us. And this was the, the main spread which we uh, used during the wreck removal operations. All the equipment what we need, depending on the, 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 the salvage, come from uh, the, the warehouse here in Rotterdam. Uh, we have a lot of pumps, a lot of uh, dive equipment, air uh, diving, uh, saturation diving. Everything is here in uh, Rotterdam. Dus er is nothing on a share leak. If we like to have a share leak, then all the equipment is coming from uh, Rotterdam, the warehouse. The Jan Breidel is a, a fishing vessel, a cotter we, uh, we call it. It's about 35 meters long. Um, it used to um, uh, uh, fish in the, within the channel off the coast of, um, of uh, Belgium. And it got hit in uh, 1988, if I'm not mistaken, by, uh, by a freight carrier, a normal vessel and it sank almost instantly. Salvage masters must first gather necessary data and coordinates for locating the shipwreck and determining its condition. Well, basically we need a, a good survey. Um, quite often we also do our own dive surveys just to, to see with our own eyes uh, what uh, the situation is uh, uh, below uh, the, the seawater. The call goes out to the divers and technicians who must be ready at a moment's notice to take off on their next international salvage mission. When they give me a call, uh, exactly in the, uh, in the night, then uh, I say goodbye to uh, family, I take my suitcase and I take a taxi and they bring me to uh, Rotterdam Airport or to uh, Schiphol. Ten years beforehand, Smith had used its shear legs and its cutting edge technology to remove the tricolor which sank nearby with its cargo of 3,000 automobiles in December 2002 while traveling from Belgium to the UK 
after a collision with another container ship. No lives were lost, but the ship remained stuck in the mud in a waterway that was just 30 meters deep. The salvage operation in 2003-2004 used a unique cutting wire to carve the wreck into nine sections, each one a whopping 3,000 tons. The massive shear legs that Smith used can raise weight of up to 4,000 tons. In the summer of 2013, Bart decided since they could do it, they would raise the wreck of the Jan Bridal wholly intact. They needed divers to check the situation of the wreck, however, and to clean out any debris in the way of the slings. Every salvage job we, we start with is uh, starting with a dive inspection so we know the, the situation uh, uh, near and uh, on the wreck. Divers doing the inspection must stay underwater hours at a time in order to pinpoint weak and strong areas of the vessel that can best hold slings and cables. They usually wear this helmet to communicate with a computer above the surface through dedicated cables. This is a super light, it's very light. It is about uh, 17, uh, uh, one seven uh, kilo. It's, it's not so super light. And this one is the umbilical. Uh, the umbilical uh, go to the dive panel and to the helmet. Inside of, of one of this umbilical is air, uh, light, uh, video, a depth meter. Sometimes it's, uh, it, it will be uh, thicker. And then it's also hot water for saturation for the suits. Because the Jan Bridal was intact and standing straight up on the bottom of the sea floor, divers were able to quickly make their determinations. We found that, um, uh, that we had good points uh, where we could um, uh, attach the, the slings to. So we, we were quite confident after the first two dives that we, uh, that we could manage uh, and we could do this job. Uh, actually quite, quite rapidly also because everything was free and uh, we did not have to do any uh, additional work such as uh, uh, airlifting or uh, removal of uh, quite a lot of um, uh, sediment. This was, uh, we could do everything in one time. The fishing boat, similar to so many that ply their trade through the North Sea, lay upright so divers were able to slip the first sling under the rudder and propeller fairly easily. The bow was more of a problem, however. Well, the, the, the sling on the aft ship was fairly easy because uh, the, the, the so-called window uh, near to the, the rudder and the propeller was free, so we could easily um, uh, bring the, uh, the aft sling underneath. The forward sling was a, a little bit more difficult. We had to lift her uh, with one uh, sling, like a, and to make some, uh, some more uh, room between the, the keel of the vessel and the, and the seabed, so which, uh, which would enable us to uh, put a forward sling also in the correct position. So it would be a one stable um, uh, hoist. There was a little bit of space underneath uh, the uh, Jan Breidel. Then we, uh, we put a, a big uh, steel wire. We put it underneath. It was more than enough, I thought about two meters. Then uh, we heave it up. We have a lot of uh, space more. Then we bring another uh, uh, the, uh, a double uh, steel wire underneath. Then we touch it down. And on uh, the shaft, we have also uh, a space. And then we bring the other uh, steel wire. Under the hydraulic pull of the massive shear leg, the Jan Bridal began to gradually emerge from the abyss of the North Sea. Salvage masters monitored her slow rise to the surface. The intact boat was a spectacle to see, covered with mollusks and sea creatures of every kind and rusted by her years underwater. Right, go, that's a nice one, eh? Put yeah. the kids, eh? Yeah, the kids. For your boy. Yeah, yeah that's nice. Yeah. Once brought up from the dark depths, the sunken fishing boat took on the spooky aura of a ghost ship. Right, that's a nice one, eh? By the end of August 2013, 
The Van den Herrick team has successfully reduced the Ariana wreck to a safe height and now turns its attention to another wreck that sank in the 1800s off the windy island of Leland in the north of Holland. The remote area of Northern Ireland is an important shipping route because Northern Holland's renewable energy industry is rapidly expanding, requiring larger vessels to have access to its power plants. From the, the North Sea to Eemshaven, in the north we have the port of Groningen, and Groningen has developed an area of uh, big importance called Eemshaven with power plants and uh, windmill energy. So big expanding in Groningen, Eemshaven. And for the power plants, there is a uh, need of bigger chips. In 2012, Van den Herrick was involved in a massive cleanup of the northern approaches to the Dutch city of Groningen, strategic to the nation due to its massive wind farms. Here, Van den Herrick partnered with another company to raise a number of wrecks that littered the sea floor but had to carefully avoid damaging vital underwater power cables. It was a delicate task. Now Van den Herrick was contracted to clean up a wreck close to the windswept shores of Leland in the north of Holland. In this operations room, Van den Herrick engineers and salvage technicians study all there is to know about the tides, shifting sands, and Dutch waterways they are called upon to keep clean. Like in all salvage operations, a number of things can go wrong. You have to cope with the elements, and you have to have luck or bad, and a very good plan and good equipment, and very, very uh, good people who stand for the job. I think that's all elements make you are successful or not. As the Van den Herrick teams left for the port of Harlingen, the October storms were on their way. They had a short window of good weather in which to complete the work, so they hoped to find the wreck quickly. Dawn rises on the flatlands of Holland. Children make their way to school in the characteristic port town of Harlingen. On the quayside, the crew of two barges, the Prince Four and the Prince Five, prepare for their extraordinary mission out into the North Sea. The team must work fast into good weather because the sea around Vleeland is known to be treacherous for ships in bad weather. The hundreds of shipwrecks lying at the bottom of the sea attest the dangers of the area. René Tromp is the supervisor of this operation too. He must oversee every detail of the complex effort to clear the Dutch channels so they are deeper and can accommodate bigger vessels. I think a lot of uh, uh, commercial uh, merchandising is still going over the sea, especially in Holland with a few big harbors. And so it's very important for Holland and the Dutch government to uh, keep clear of all their, uh, the, the main uh, sea routes. And deeper, huh? so they can uh, have bigger ships, uh, but also the, the main routes to the harbors has to grow with them. On the barge, salvage workers under his command check every cable and piece of equipment to make sure the gear is operational before setting sail. With him is surveyor Bram van der Kooy. They employ a mix of new technology and traditional methods to get the job done. Very little is known about the wreck they must salvage as it sunk in 1866. The actual name of the wreck is uh, the mail bank. It's been reported missing in 1866 and this cargo was uh, bags of meal and wool and a few days after it was reported missing the beaches of uh, Vlieland were full of sacks with meal and yeah, the people of Vlieland uh, sold it and made uh, sweaters of it. So that's why uh, the 
Theologus think it's that ship. The crew set sail with the barges in tow. The weather is fair and hopes are high they will soon be able to find the ship on the first day out. The waters off Vleeland are lined with wrecks of all kinds. Finding the right one will be a challenge. The Prince 5 is a jack-up barge with three 20-meter long legs. These legs are lowered down to rest firmly on the sea floor. Once there, they turn the floating barge into a stable platform from which to work with the diggers and grabbers. These pontoons can be transported with tugs to salvages or ship disasters all over the world. A pontoon, it's Prince 5. It's a pontoon from, uh, from 40 by 10 meters and there's a big excavator on it, 120 ton. It can reach until uh, 14, 15 meters under the waterline. And we've got a big uh, yeah, cutting teeth on it so we can uh, rip the rack apart. Afterwards we put on a normal uh, digging bucket uh, to, uh, to grab the pieces which have been uh, ripped apart. The transport barge is also the crew's accommodation, kitchen, and of the two vessels, the only one that actually has an engine. The other material that we're having here is the Prince 4. It's an old uh, ship from the Dutch army. They used to uh, bring tanks from Harlingen to Vlieland, so we bought it and we put a crane on it. And uh, in this job it's uh, for the for moving around because the Prince 5 has no own, uh, own propellers. Erman and Dirk are the crane operators and they manage the hydraulic systems aboard the jack-up barge. The accommodation barge is an old military transport and is perfectly suited to carrying the debris from the wreck and the heavy equipment. GPS satellite systems locate the barge precisely and the monitor indicates the estimated position of the wreck with the vertical and horizontal elevations. It is the task of René and Bram to provide accurate information to the crane operators. The barge is then positioned carefully over exactly where the computers determined it to be and the crane is prepared for its fishing operation. Before we start the job, uh, there's been a survey done by an, uh, a third uh, company. Eh? So it's uh, how we, we have no influence on it. Eh? So we get that survey and we take a look from uh, what surface do we have to reach eh? and make free. So we put that in the crane and there we start working. The coordination between man and machine is delicate. The computer tells the crane operator exactly where to position the bucket and grabber. It is time to start the underwater expedition. From the archaeologist, we've got a rather precise survey and also a description what's the front of the ship and what's the back of the ship from the historical museum they've got here. Uh, all those information has been put together by the archaeologists and they give me a, a form, so that's why I got my information. This map shows the Vleeland sea floor covered with dozens of wrecks from centuries gone by. It is one of the world's busiest sea lanes, running from the channel ports of France and England up past the largest port in the world to the far north. Tankers and transport vessels share the sea with fishing boats from the Dutch ports. This is an area Van den Herrick knows well. There is no way of bringing the whole ship up, so René and his men have no choice but to break it up. The main thing they are looking for is the engine, the boiler, something that can identify the wreck for posterity and for the records of the Dutch government. The surveyor sets the depths for the digger arm so as to be sure to reach the sunken ship, but still the wreck remains elusive 
as the current slowly pushes the barge off site. Every couple of hours, the captain orders a repositioning. <laughs> Several times a day, René and Bram go out in the survey boat to carry out a multi-beam reconnaissance of the wreck. To calibrate the sonar data properly, Bram uses this sensor to measure the speed of sound underwater. I drop it to the, to the bottom, and then I, uh, it, it registrates uh, on every meter uh, what is the, the, the speed, the sound of the speed of the, of the water. So on every meter, I. I'll get a, a speed. This way, the sonar that Rene lowers from the bow of the survey boat can accurately map out horizontal and vertical elevations of the wreck. He compiles a day-by-day -day report as to progress, and Bram passes this data on to the monitors in the crane cabin. We have uh, a system on us with the GPS, and uh, there are there are all kinds of sensors who are. Um, measuring how the, the boom and the stick and the bucket go. And in combination with the GPS system, we exactly know how deep he is with the bucket. This allows the crane operators Dirk and Erdmann to fix any machinery. Crane operators continue their search, adjusting the equipment to the new data being given by the sensors underwater. They don't find the shipwreck on the first try, or the second, or the third. It is an imprecise science that takes patience and skill. Then suddenly, the barge shudders. The monitor shows that they have reached the right depth, and now the correct coordinates too. The hook has pierced the wreck's rusting hull. It comes thundering down onto the transport bar. The bolts and welding betray the age of the ship. It looks like an 1860 steamer, but only finding the boiler will be decisive in identifying it once and for all. Crabs scuttle away. Erman, the crane operator, finds an interesting artifact, one of the ship's portholes. It has been twisted under the pressure of the waves. None of the crew survived the shipwreck. And now René and his team saw firsthand what was left of that tragedy. As the coupled barges realign with the wreck, René and Bram go back out to survey the sea floor and estimate the height to which they must cut the wreck. Their biggest problem now is positively identifying it so that the Reichswaterstadt can be sure that the obstacle they had identified has indeed been removed. Can we really find the engine? There's an engine number in it, and so they can prove it's this ship. Aboard, Dirk is still using the survey data installed in his cabin computer to aim at the wreck, attempting to remove whole pieces. The search is on for the boiler. Tonight, with low water, we're gonna try to uh, get two spots with the bucket. And we can do that in one low water tide. After we've done that tonight, uh, they're going to build up with the, uh, with, the, with the grabber to try to get hold of the motor. Now that salvage masters have located the wreck with certainty, they must change the hook and put on the bigger bucket to bring up the larger pieces of the wreck. It takes a whole team to swap the massive pieces of equipment. Finally, the large bucket with teeth is lowered into the water. It hits its goal immediately. More pieces of the mill bank are brought to the surface. But as the sun sets, 
and the day's work nears its end, there is another complication. Mother Nature. A storm is brewing, and the crew must begin to batten down the hatches. These coasts are among the most dangerous, especially during inclement weather. It is the north wind that has caused so many ships to sink off this coast. Rene has no choice but to call in the tugboats. They have to go to safer waters. A storm is brewing over Vleeland, but the Van den Herrick crew does not stop working. They prepare the equipment for the next day's operations. Dawn rises over Vleeland and the storm has subsided. The barges take up their positions of the previous day and the search for the boiler of the mill bank begins. As pieces of the wreck mount up, the crew search for clues to its identity. From the remains, they believe that the ship is the Millbank, which was recorded by the Lloyd's Register as being lost on this coastline in 1866. In order to prove it, however, the crew still has to find the boiler, breaking up the superstructure as much as possible to expose the engine room. The storm has left choppy seas, and the tides affect the depth they can work at. The tide is low and the wind has calmed. In the early hours of the morning, Dirk strikes something hard with the bucket. He has come to know the wreck like the back of his hand, and he thinks he knows what the hard and heavy object is. Before the hunt for the boiler can be concluded, however, the crew realize that the two barges have moved apart during the windy night. For perfect accuracy in removing the boiler, they have to be tied back together again, an operation that is easier said than done. Once again, the grabber is put on. Once the gripper is on, it can be located to the exact spot of the heavy object, which they believe is the boiler. The brittle iron that comes up confirms their hopes that the piece is too heavy to lift intact. The operation takes several days and the sea has become rough, making accurate surveys harder. However, only at the end of it can René feel satisfied. We also removed the boiler, it was a little bit too high, uh, but because it was uh, yeah, too big to uh, tear apart at that depth, approximately 30 tons, 35 tons. We couldn't lift it on board, dragged it to shallow water and then uh, we left it for a few days and today uh, we flushed it a little bit so that it was cleaner, all the mud was out and then we torn it apart and yet it's on deck. Piece by piece the engine of the mill bank is broken up and brought on deck. It piles up sadly on the barge, ready for official inspection. As soon as it leaves the sea floor, it begins to rust and decay. Every sort of ship goes by as the remains of the mill bank are brought to the surface. The company compliance officer takes pictures to show the Reichswaterstadt. He collects the survey data gathered by René. This week we achieved uh, almost everything uh, we wanted. There are only uh, two or three small points this morning who are still uh, above the level that we have to, uh, to reach. So uh, we removed those this morning. And then I hope with the survey from this afternoon that uh, everything is uh, free of objects. At the end of the summer cleanup campaign, the Van den Herrick team write their final report for the Dutch government. The Westerschelt and seas off Vleeland are safe for large ships. 
close by at the Smith Salvage Yards. The salvage team that pulled up the Jan Bridal in 2013 can also be proud of their work. As the largest salvage company in the world, Smith can count on the most powerful shear legs. The Smith equipment is built to raise the biggest and the smallest of brakes. Uh, in the end, we had um, uh, roughly around 600, 650 uh, tons on the. It, it's a little bit difficult to say because the water is still dripping out and some sediment is still um, uh, dripping out. Tucklift 7 can lift uh, 1,200 tons, so it would be well within the capacity of the of the tucklift uh, to lift uh, the Jan Bridal. As the Jan Bridal was transferred to be broken up on the Smith transport barge. The team moved north to reduce the unknown wreck in the Ijol Canal using Smith's giant grabbers. This too had been a question of simply reducing the height of a sunken ship. Wreck is uh, positioned uh, within the new uh, approach to Eimuiden uh, port. Um, they also want to uh, uh, be able to bring in uh, more uh, deeper draught uh, vessels. But nobody knows um, what is wreck. Uh, is uh, when it sank and uh, they believe it would be between 1910-1920. Uh, we had a big uh, crab in our share leak, in the tuck lift uh, 6 and uh, it's on shore you see some grabs but this one is huge it's about wide seven meters when it is open it's seven meters wide okay we lower it down we lower it down like this touch the bottom then we go with 50 50 tons, we close it, we make more force in it, more force in it, then it, it, it keeps about 100 tons like that. The weight of the, the grab is about 90 ton, eh, 90 ton. Then uh, we grab them and then we go slowly up, go slowly up. When it is on, uh, on the surface, big barges are coming. Eh? We, 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 uh, the, the barge, we bring it very close to the, uh, to the shellic and then Slowly down, 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 lower, open, 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 and then it's fall down, and then we do the same thing again. With two wreck removals each, Smith Salvage and Van den Herrick have both helped to make Dutch waters safer for the biggest transport ships in the world. The Millbank and the Ariana have been successfully removed. The Jan Bridal has been brought up in one majestic piece, and the mystery steamship has been cleared from its dangerous resting place. Each year, salvage operations like these are helping to make the Dutch channels deeper and safer, able to accommodate even bigger ships that are the lifeblood of Europe's new economy. But while four wrecks have been removed, there are still many more on the seabed. And as the sun sets on the North Sea, a lonely lighthouse signals the dangers of the shallow waters, a reminder of the graveyard of ships just below the surface of the sea.